as Brother Caleb said this morning, this is this lesson is my God. I appreciate what he said, and I was thinking about it as he was up here talking just a moment ago. Now, if you've got a if you've got a pet or if you've got a, had multiple children, then you know that there can be some jealousy sometimes because those kids want full attention all the time. <clears throat> and I was just thinking about that, Brother Caleb talking. Um, we don't have that issue with God. There, there should be no, no jealousy in our hearts concerning my God. Because we don't have to share Him like we have to share a person, a mother, a father, a, a whatever. That he, is, he can be my God fully, completely, every moment of my life. At the same time, He can be your God as well. At that same time. And throughout the world, He's not limited <laughs> as us humans are in, in that respect. He can give us all full attention. We don't. I've, I know that personally, I've I've had issues in my life. That, you know, I don't I don't want to bother God with this right now. There's so many bigger things He needs to deal with. No, He He's big enough. He can take care of it. Right. He can deal with my little problems at the same time He's dealing with somebody else's big problems. So, yes. always remember that. Always. Uh, I know that I've sat back and and not uh, been prayed for because I think oh, someone else needs more than I do, but. We shouldn't have those thoughts. God, our God, is bigger than that. He is my God. Now in the Hebrew, original in the Old Testament, a God is known by several names. These words are all translated either into God or Lord, but they come from several Hebrew words. And I'm not using, like, uh, there are some. We know uh, there was a song we sang here recently at the Zion Hill Revival. And it's talking about El... Um, Oh, goodness. Anyway, I can't think of any of them right now. Jehovah Rapha and Jehovah uh, Jireh and all these things like that. Now, those are additions to the name of God, Jehovah. I'm not talking about those kind of things, but actual names, words that are used that have been just simply translated as God or Lord. <clears throat> of course, the one everyone's familiar with is El, which is a generic word for God. In any context, and also in in the Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew, you'll find it when it's speaking of false gods. The word El is used. Now, then everyone's heard of Elohim, which is both singular and plural at the same time, revealing the Trinity in the Old Testament. And it came to my mind this morning as I was reading back over the lesson again. There's another word that I overlooked: Eloah, E L O A H, which can be either singular or dual for Elohim. This word also has the same linguistic origin as the Arabic word Allah, El Shaddai, which is God Almighty, Jehovah or Yahweh, which means to be or to exist. This is, this is the source of God being called I Am, since this is also an alternate translation of the same Hebrew word. And the word Adonai, which means my Lord or my God. All of these are rendered simply Lord or God in the Bible, truly limiting our understanding of who God is and who He wants to be to all of us. Now, reading the Bible is important, but the understanding we get by simply looking at the words on the page is far less than what God would have us to know. God wants us to dig deeply into His Word. And if we'll allow the Spirit to lead us as we do so, the knowledge that we can glean is unlimited. It is God's will for all of us to grow through our understanding of His Word. God wants His voice to be heard. This series is the voice of God. He wants to be heard. He wants us to hear Him speak. And in the commentary here, as we studied last week, Moses was a friend of God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob chose this unusual man, a Hebrew, raised in Pharaoh's palace and driven out after he committed murder, as perhaps his best friend of the Old Testament era. The Bible notes that God had such great regard for Moses that He spoke to him face to face and chose to bury Moses himself. 
Now, it must be understood that when we read that Moses spoke to God face to face, that this is symbolic of their relationship and not a literal account of their discussions as if Moses was capable of beholding the full glory of God, of the eternal God. In this very lesson, we will soon read Exodus 33 and 20 where we see God, that God says, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Also Exodus 33 and 23 where he says, And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. We also read in Numbers 12, 6 through 8, And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, and I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and in the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. The similitude of the Lord shall he behold. God revealed himself to Moses in a form that would not consume him utterly, simply by his presence. Yet even this had side effects that we read in Exodus 34, 29, 30, and 35 after Moses had spent a second 40 days with God. Verse 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went to speak with him. Talking about God. Now Paul said of this same account in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 9 and verse 18, But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory." The brightness of the glory of the Lord in the face of Moses was according to the law, which was to be done away with. But the glory God would have to be revealed in us is eternal in nature. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's God's will that we attain the glory that He has proposed for us. How do we do that? By recognizing that God is not an impersonal deity who sits somewhere in the distance and we have nothing to do with, and will have nothing to do with lowly creation. But He wants us to know that He was willing to take on the form of human flesh and die in our place so that He could be close to each and every one of us, so that He could be among us and within us and reveal the fullness of His glory to us by living through us. The voice of God is calling out to us through His Word so that His eternal glory would also be seen by the world around us as He lives through us. Beginning with today's lesson, we will study one of these face-to-face -face encounters which Moses and God had, and what God revealed to His friend during this meeting in the mountain. The Golden Truth, Psalm 18, Psalms 18 and 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. God 
is everything we need to keep us safe from the enemy. Yet it remains our responsibility to make the most of who He is and what He has for us. A fortress and a tower are of no strategic benefit if we refuse to enter into them. A buckler or a shield will protect no one if it remains kept in storage or placed out for proud display. And the strength of the Lord will only be effective when we are fully submitted to God. This is only possible when we both hear and obey His voice in all things and at all times. A lesson commentary part 1. Exodus 3 and 10. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Exodus 34, 1 through 3. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tablets of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these, these tables, the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout the, all the mount. Excuse me. Neither let flocks or, nor herds feed before the mount. By the time of the face-to-face -face encounter in today's lesson, Moses and God were already acquainted. God had no doubt watched his friend as he, when he was pushed in, into the Nile in a basket as an infant. Now this was clearly God's providence in supplying one who would eventually rescue his own people by God's miraculous power. This is how God works throughout His Word and in our lives today. He works mightily through flawed humans, such as Moses, who are willing to hear and obey Him. He wants us to hear His voice. And, and the only way we can do that is by submitting ourselves to His Word. He will speak to us through the Bible if we'll surrender ourselves to God. Allow the Spirit. There was a time when I was new to the church and I was very concerned that I might be led astray by the thoughts of men. And I had this <clears throat> sincere desire to get into God's Word and not read anything else. And I, I know I've mentioned it before, but I, I, there was a, a time in my life, I think it was around 10 years, where I didn't read anything but the Bible. And I read the Bible as much as I could. I, at that point in my life, I read every version of the Bible, every translation of the Bible I could get my hands on because I wanted to know God personally without any of the distractions of, of potential confusion with church teachings or anything else. I wanted said, Lord, lead me as I read your word. Show me your truth. Speak to me that I would know your will and how it applies to me and what you would have, you would have me to know from your word. And after that time, I started picking up church books. And you know what? It, basically the same thing. And I praise the Lord because if I hadn't had the desire to find God's will, I could have thought myself led astray. I could have been led astray. But by submitting myself to the Spirit, I had an understanding that the church had already dug out. Why? Because God wants us to know who He is. He wants us to know Him personally. He wanted me to know Him on a first name basis. He is my God. He is Adonai to me. Back in the commentary, God introduced Himself to Moses decades later in the wilderness where He spoke through a burning bush. It was in this first conversation that God identified Himself as, I am Jehovah, Yahweh, and told Moses of His plans to use Him to deliver <coughs> Israel from Egyptian slavery. God already knew Moses. 
But Moses didn't truly know God until his burning bush introduction. <laughs> Certainly his understanding of God grew from that point forward. But God knows how to get our attention. God knows what it's going to take in each of our lives to open our eyes to who He is. But like Moses, it's up to us to turn aside. That bush was burning, and from what I understand of these, these particular bushes, they say that there's a bush, and, and because of the construction of this bush, they have a tendency to catch on fire. They, they do that in the, in the Sinai Desert. But they tend to just poof, you know, just burn out. You know, it, it's, it's not unusual to see a bush on fire in the desert. You know? So, okay, that's, that's a, it's a bush on fire. But hold it. That, that bush just keeps on burning. That's, that's different. Something's different there. You know? So God knew how to get His attention. <laughs> and He knows how to get ours. Yes, he, does. he knows what it's going to take. Uh, I, I know I've heard people say, if, if I had a burning bush experience, I'd change my mind about God. Well, how many burning bushes do we pass on this life's journey thinking that's, that's not the one? Well, well I, I saw that happen, but that's, that's not. That's just a, it's a coincidence. It's a fluke. It's, that wasn't God. How many times have I personally done that? How many times have I seen God trying to get my attention and simply ignored him or justified myself in ignoring whatever the situation was. God wants to get our attention. He wants to be my God to each and every one of us. He wants us to know him personally. God has a plan for each and every one of us. But it's up to us. Will we hear? Will we obey the way that Moses did? That's, that's what this lesson it should be getting across to us. It's up to us. We have, the cho we have a choice to make. Will we choose to call Him my God? And if we call Him my God, that requires something of us. That requires our submission. Uh, we talk about God as being King of kings. And, and I know I've also spoken of this in the past. In order for a king to be your king... You have to be submitted to the king's rule. You don't get to petition the king for a change of his laws. You submit yourself to the laws that he has made. Or you're destroyed. God's, God's not seeking to destroy anyone. God wants us all to have life. As Jesus said, have it more abundantly. He wants us to know what it is to be called his child. As a king, uh, the the, the lowly people in the kingdom, they don't, they don't receive much but protection from the king. But the king we serve, he doesn't want us to just, in the, in the feudal system and, and all that stuff in and, and old times, basically what happened is however much land the king owned, that supported the king. It supplied for his army, it put food on his table, it did everything he wanted. And all those people, they were subservient to Him. They were servants to the King, basically. Whatever it was they were doing, from the, from the ones harvesting and planting the fields to the, to the ones who were in His army. They were all servants of the King and subject to His will. The God we serve doesn't want us to be servants. He doesn't want just to make himself bigger because a lot of time the king, all he wanted, he wanted more land so he could make himself more wealthy. So it was for him. But the God we serve, my God, he is a king. But his desire is not to support himself, to make himself greater by the numbers of people and the amount of stuff that he has. God's desire for us as our king is to supply for us and to be what we need, and to not simply look down on us as servants, but to raise us up as children, His children, to sit at His table, to be His sons and daughters. As I said earlier, and not to have to worry about jealousy. Well, well this one got more than that one. I, 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 should, I should be closer to God. Well, if you have a long table, someone's going to be far away from somebody else. 
But as we sit and feast at God's table, the benefit is it's, it's one-on-one. We can all sit at the same table and all be right before God and have His ear. He is my God. He is your God. And, and we don't have to worry about, well, this one's closer than that one. Because we all serve the same God and He all, wants all of us to be right there. And He can hear us at the same time. And He can see to our needs simultaneously. And He's not divided among so many thoughts. I've seen uh, television shows or whatever. Mother has 15 kids and she's trying to do this and that one's doing something else and causing problems and one falls into the soup and it just everything's going crazy because there's so many children and she's trying to take care and she's just one person. God's not like that. God can see to every need at the same time. That's why we can call Him my God. And He is our personal God. He's not uh, scratching His head. What am I going to do? i got all these people and they're all crazy. What am I going to do with them? He's in the midst of each individual in each situation that they may be facing dealing with them, seeing to their needs, helping us if we'll simply call out to Him and recognize that He is our God as individuals. He's my God. Between, sorry, between Exodus 3 and 10 and Exodus 34 and 1, a lot happened. I think that's the understatement of the year. <laughs> There's a whole lot happened between these two verses of Scripture. God did use Moses not only to free the, the children of Israel from slavery, but also to receive much wealth in the form of gold, silver, and jewels from the Egyptians. God delivered the Ten Commandments to Israel through Moses, who broke the first set in anger when he discovered that Israel had engaged in the sin of idolatry. God also gave Moses his detailed plans for an organized priesthood and a traveling worship center that would serve as the only official house of God until the time of Solomon and the first temple. Through the giving of the law and the establishment of organized worship, God had already revealed a great deal of His nature to Moses and to Israel. But there was something more as Moses would find out on that morning visit to Mount Sinai. God did not call him there to simply give him another copy of the cornerstones of the law. God wanted to speak to his friend face to face. And Moses had experienced the power of God through the many undeniable signs and miracles up until that very day. He saw firsthand how Jehovah had defeated the, the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods through the ten plagues. Because that's exactly what the ten plagues did. It wasn't simply things that made the Israelite or the, the Egyptians uncomfortable. Each of these plagues directly attacked one of the many gods that the Egyptians served and didn't just attack them, completely overwhelmed them, overthrew them, destroyed them. Moses saw the presence of God become a wall of fire to hold back the Egyptian army as God parted the Red Sea. And then he walked through that same Red Sea as on dry ground with a wall of water on his right hand and on his left. He had received the miraculous water and manna and quail in the wilderness. He was well acquainted with the power of the God he served. Yet he felt as if something was still missing from that relationship. <clears throat> he wanted more. Isn't that where we should all be? We can, we can look back on our own lives and we can see where God has, has done the miraculous. Where He's kept us in, in things that we couldn't imagine ourselves going through where He's done things that we, we couldn't see possible before they had occurred. We see the power of God. 
And how does that make us behave? Does that make us simply thankful? I I thank You, Lord, for all those things You've done for me. I'm just going to keep moving forward. Or do we recognize what God has done for us and, and do we say, Lord, I want to know You better. I want to know more of You. I, I, I see all those things that you've done in my past. But that's not enough because I want more of you. The things of this world, I'm satisfied. i got a roof over my head. i got a, I got a job. I'm able to pay my bills. Those things are fine. I have enough of what this world has to offer. What I want is more of you. Is that where we are? Can we honestly say that that's that's our desire? Our first and foremost desire is to know God better? Clearly it was Moses' desire. I can't imagine seeing the things that that Moses saw and thinking, you know, that's, that's just not enough, God. I want more of you. But that's where he was. And that's where we should be. Have any of us seen the miraculous things that Moses has seen? then why are we satisfied with what little we've received from God, spiritually speaking? Jesus prayed that we would be in the same kind of unity among ourselves that He and the Father were. That perfect unity. We should have a hunger for more of what God has for us. He's my God. He's our God. We need what God has for us. And we need to have a desire. That's that's what we see in Moses here. We need to have that same hunger that no matter what we receive from God, we want to know Him better. We want to know more of Him. Are the things of this earth? If we're we're moving forward in this life, if we've got a place to live... If we got clothes on our back and food in our stomachs, we should be satisfied with those things. But with our knowledge of the Lord, with our relationship with Him, uh, uh, Wendy, I, I love her more than anything, and, and I think I know her better than anybody in this room. But I want to know her more because she's my wife. I, I don't want to be satisfied with the relationship that we have. Say, so, okay, well, I can just go now because I've, I know Wendy as well as I know her. I want to continue with that relationship. I want to know her better. I want us to be what God would have us to be. And that's only possible if we move forward in the relationship that God has provided. How much more should we desire what God has for us? God's will. And desire to see those things accomplished in our lives that He would have us to accomplish for His glory. They'll work for our benefit too. Uh, the, the, God's will for us is not simply to make Him look bigger like I was talking about with the king earlier. It's for our benefit. He wants to be our God as individuals so that He can make us what He would have us to be for our benefit and for the benefit of those around us. Back in the commentary part two, a personal relationship. Exodus 33, 18, 20, 22, and 23. And he said, I beseech thee, this is Moses talking, show me thy glory. And God said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now here's an interesting point about the language in this particular portion of Scripture. When we read back parts in this passage, we often just simply imagine the form of a person who has passed by us showing only the backside of his body to remain visible. But the Hebrew word that is translated as back parts in this particular verse of Scripture could just as easily be translated as hereafter, or time to come. It's been theorized by some that what Moses saw was not the back of a person, but a vision of Jesus Christ in the flesh, the hereafter, what God would do, what God's plan, the finality of God's plan in revealing who He was to the world, not simply to the Israelites, 
but to the world. Uh, this brother, Brother Smith, our former general overseer, mentioned this, I believe, in, in one of his devotions. And it, it really opened my eyes to having a desire to dig deeper into the Scripture and look at those words and what they mean in the original language. We read of a time, he didn't say anything about this, but this is just something that I thought about when he mentioned that. We read of a time on the mountain when Jesus spoke with Moses and Elijah of His coming crucifixion and resurrection. Luke 9, 28-31. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, He took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as He prayed, the fashion of His countenance was altered. And his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory. And he spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, this is just me. But I believe this is very likely the vision that Moses saw when he saw the backside, the the latter end of, of God. He spoke with the Son of God concerning God's plans for the time to come. That's that's what we see. Now this this is, once again, this is my opinion. I don't have anybody to back this up, anything else to back this up. But I believe this is likely the hereafter that Moses saw as God passed by. He saw the day of Jesus. He heard about His crucifixion and what it would mean for the world. Just my opinion. Just my two cents. Exodus 34, 5 and 6. And I feel need to, the need to re- go ahead and add verse 9 to that. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And chapter, verse 9 And he said, this is Moses, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. God was not the only one who desired this long-awaited meeting. As we can see in Exodus 33 and 18, Moses requested it, and God, in his love for his friend, readily agreed. Now God knew what Moses was yet to face before he would go on to his reward. He knew that Moses would need a special insight into the plan of God if he was to persevere until the end. Aaron had already shown his weakness in providing the golden calf for the people to worship. Many others would fall by the wayside in one manner or another before they ended up reaching the promised land. Moses would need the strength that only God could provide if he was to successfully lead his people home. We know that as meek as he was, Moses failed God and was not able to enter the promised land himself. All this was after the frequent personal interactions with God with the God of creation and the many miracles that Moses had seen God perform firsthand. This should help us to understand the greatness of our need for God and the weakness of our human nature. Without a firm focus on the voice of God in our own lives, we are certain to fail. On that morning, Moses, he set Moses in a place of physical protection and descended in a cloud, perhaps the same way he once met with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But because Moses was a mortal man, God protected him from seeing his face and the death that would certainly result. Can you imagine what, what must have been going on in that mountain? Moses was tucked between two rock surfaces while the entire force of creation walked past. If that man was not already, if that was not already enough to make him tremble, God then began speaking from this close proximity. Interestingly, 
He spoke entirely of who He is and what He is like during this revelation. He must have known that those questions were still burning in Moses' mind in spite of their many encounters. And like He did in the wilderness, He introduced Himself as I Am. God began announcing His name. Twice God referred to Himself excuse me, as the Lord. In the original Hebrew, the word that is translated as Lord is a series of letters that represents the name Jehovah or Yahweh. When God met Moses in the wilderness, He was I Am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in verse 9, Moses calls God Adonai twice, claiming Him as His own personal God. What Moses had known before was even more clear than it had been in the past after this personal encounter. On that incredible morning on Mount Sinai, there was just Moses, God, and those precious words. Moses then knew that this God of incredible force and power was his personal God, his friend. And in conclusion, God made great efforts to get to know Moses in a personal way. He is doing the same thing today, but not just for one special person. Through His Son, Jesus, God is seeking out whosoever will. As pointed out this morning, whosoever is important. That means anybody. God is seeking anybody. But that last word is also critical. Whosoever will. Anybody who is willing to submit themselves to God. If you are willing to submit yourselves to God as your king, He won't push you down as a subject. But if you're willing to surrender yourself to God, He will lift you up to be a son or a daughter. He loves us that much. His desire is to be my God to each and every one of us. Once again, we don't have to be jealous. We don't have to worry about who gets the most attention. God can give us all the same amount of attention at any point in time. Have you accepted this extraordinary offer? If you have not accepted, why not? If you have, are you living each day with the understanding that you are in intimate fellowship with Adonai, my God? He is my God. And at the same time, He's your God. He wants us all to have that personal relationship. Once again, not so He can press us down and make Himself bigger, but so that He can lift us up and make us whom He would have us to be for His glory and our benefit. When we're surrendered to Him and when we're allowing the Spirit to, to fully live through us, we receive benefit. But not only that, that light that should shine through us should affect those around us. Just like Moses when he came down from the mountain and his face was shining. His face was glowing simply from being in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm looking around here and, and nobody's, face, um, nobody's face is actually glowing. I, there's some proud parents over there. They're, they're close, but no. Uh, nobody's face is actually brightening the room by their presence. But God wants His light to shine through us in such a way that it would lighten lives of others and they would desire to draw close to God themselves. He's not, God is not satisfied simply being my God. He wants to be a God to those who currently don't serve Him. Once again, not to press them down into His service, but to lift them up and make them His sons and daughters. Whosoever will. Anyone who is willing. Is literally what that means. Anyone who is willing can be a son or daughter of God. By submitting to Him as King, He will lift us up and so that we can be not simply a subject, but sons or daughters and reveal His glory to others for their benefit <coughs> and ours. 
We've got a couple of minutes left. Any comments? 